Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So the video that I have for you guys today is one that is solved, but as I always say with a lot of these solved cases, it's one that we can all learn from. I know I preach a lot in so many of my videos about just being there for one another and finding ways to keep our friends and loved ones safe, but I say it a lot because it's such an important message and I wanna make sure I speak on it every chance that I get. This case involves two beautiful young women whose lives were taken for absolutely no reason other than being in the wrong places at the wrong times. They are so upsetting the way their cases were even able to happen, but I am glad that these two beautiful souls have gotten justice. With that being said, let's just get into today's case. Today, we're going to be discussing the solved murders of Morgan Harrington and Hannah Graham. Morgan Dana Harrington was born July 24th, 1989 in Charlottesville, Virginia to her parents, Dan and Gil Harrington. Morgan was described as being a fun-loving young woman who loved everything art and music. She was also incredibly smart, graduating high school early on the top of her class with a 3.93 GPA. After graduating high school in 2007, she she was admitted early admission into Virginia Tech. She was very clearly a very bright young woman who had a big future ahead of her and was going to go on to do great things. Now, on October 17th, 2009, Morgan and her three friends drove to the John Paul Jones Arena at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville for a Metallica concert. Now, during the opening act of the Metallica concert, Morgan told her three friends that she was going to leave really quick to go ahead and use the bathroom. However, it seems like Morgan was taking a pretty long time in the bathroom, so by 8.48 p.m., her friends called her phone to see where she was. She told her friends that she was actually locked out of the arena because she somehow got out and the arena had a no re-entry policy, but then she told her friends that she was fine and that she was just gonna find a ride home and that they didn't need to worry about it. After that, her friends just agreed and said okay and they went on with their concert. Police believe that it was at around 9, 10 p.m. that Morgan was walking with her purse through the University Hall parking area, then walked over to the grassy overflow parking in Lanigan Field. So the next thing that we know is that Morgan was seen at around 9.30 p.m. hitchhiking on the nearby Copley Road Bridge trying to find a ride home. She had left her jacket with the ticket stub inside the pocket inside the arena and it was freezing cold, as you can imagine, in October in Virginia. Witnesses said that Morgan appeared to be very confused and disoriented and appeared to be possibly injured and looked like she was freezing cold. So at this point, it is believed that Morgan and her friends were possibly impaired by alcohol or some sort of drugs. So it's thought that the reason that Morgan found herself locked out is maybe because she was wandering around, not really paying much attention to what was was going on around her and then just somehow wandered out of the stadium. This would make sense if she was on some sort of drugs or alcohol because again, if she was impaired and not really knowing what was going on, it would be easy for her to just wander off and not really know where she's going. Now, just as a side note, when it comes to her calling her friends and saying that she was going to just find a ride home and not to worry, I know that a lot of you probably got pretty annoyed at that as I did too. Most of us could agree that, you know, if that happened to us in our friend groups, you know, that if someone called and said they got locked out and we're just going to find a ride home, that yeah, I'd get annoyed that, you know, this concert that I paid for and was looking forward to was now ruined because I had to go home, you know, because most people, if their friend got locked out, at least one person in the friend group would leave to make sure that their friend was safe. But again, assuming that they were all probably intoxicated, it makes sense if they weren't in the right state of mind and just no one thought to do that and I'm sure that her friends are kicking themselves to this day regretting that they didn't go with her. So I don't want to see any comments about how irresponsible it was because I think they know and all of us do know. But again, this is one of those things that could be a lesson if one of your friends is leaving, make sure to stick with them. But this is something that we will be discussing a lot more later. So at this point, she was obviously impaired and was seen by several witnesses and was trying to find a ride home. But then after being seen on that bridge, no one knows where she had gone or what happened to her. She just left the concert and was nowhere to be found and no one knew where she had gone. Of course, Morgan's family and friends were concerned 
but their concerns grew even more when a nearby passerby found Morgan's purse with her ID and her cell phone with the cell phone's battery missing in the overflow parking area in Lanigan Field. So it was at this point that Morgan's mother reported her as missing. Immediately, over 2,000 volunteers, including family, friends, and police, all started their search for Morgan. They searched on foot to scour the entire area they made and put up flyers, and Metallica even came out with a video asking anyone with information to come forward. Police looked everywhere to see if they could find any surveillance video with her on it. They went out and asked concert goers to review any footage that they may have taken at the concert to see if they could spot Morgan in it. Police put out a $100,000 reward, with Metallica adding an additional $50,000 for any information leading to finding Morgan. And people did call in with tips, but none of them seemed very helpful. It wasn't until about three months later, on January 26, 2010, when the family got the answers that they had been looking for. On January 26, a reporter actually called Morgan's father, Dan Harrington, to see if he had any comments regarding the discovery of his daughter's remains. This is how Morgan's father found out about his daughter's remains being found. He hadn't even yet been notified by police before a reporter was able to get to him, which is just disgusting and I find that so disrespectful. I can't even imagine how he felt in that moment. So of course, after this, Morgan's parents officially found out about her daughter's remains being found. So Morgan's remains had been discovered by a farmer in a remote area about 10 miles away from the arena on Anchorage Farm about one and a half miles away from the road. Anchorage Farm is a 700 plus acre tract of pasture and woods about five miles south of Interstate 64. Her remains were found in an area that had particularly tall grass near a creek. By the time that her body was found, much of the snow that they had gotten in the previous few months had melted, which sort of flattened the tall grass in the area, which made her body a little bit easier to see. At this time, the grass still had been about knee high, but the man said that when he saw Morgan's remains, he was on his tractor several feet off the ground. He said that he initially thought that this was a deer, but then when he saw the skull, he knew that it was one of a human and he immediately called the police. The man also explained that Anchorage Farm is really hard to get onto if you don't live there. It's very hard to be able to sneak past the houses and the residents who live in the houses without being caught. So obviously it's not like these people are sitting there waiting for someone to go onto their property, but it's a very, very closed off and secluded area, so if there was someone that did not belong there, they most likely would have been recognized. It's also somewhere that an outsider would not even know about, so using all of this information, they came to the assumption that whoever dumped her body must know the Albemarle area very well. Initially, police did not release much about Morgan's cause of death, but Morgan's mother said that this was a very, very violent attack. They came out in a press briefing and said that her bones were absolutely shattered into small, jagged pieces. Her father said, quote, when you view not just a skeleton, but brutal damage to a skeleton, you can imagine what she must have gone through. They said that whoever did this to her was an extremely disturbed individual who had probably hurt other women before and will continue to hurt more people as he's on the loose. They said that they believed that this man was being protected by his environment and his circumstances and the people around him and that someone needs to come forward with whatever information that they know. So the night that Morgan went missing, she was wearing a black Pantera t-shirt, which is another heavy metal band that Morgan enjoyed listening to. Now, just rewinding a little bit, in November of 2009, it just so happened that a Pantera t-shirt had actually been found outside of an apartment complex about a mile and a half away from the arena. The shirt was actually found spread out on a bush outside of the building, almost as if they were putting the shirt out on display. It was in April of 2010 that forensic testing officially confirmed that this t-shirt was in fact the same t-shirt that Morgan was wearing the night that she went missing. On the shirt, they found Morgan's DNA as well as another unknown DNA profile. So this is what really got Morgan's cases moving in the direction to finding out exactly who did this. So the unknown DNA on Morgan's t-shirt actually matched 
DNA found at another unsolved rape case from Fairfax, Virginia, all the way back in 2005. So in 2005, a 26 year old woman reported that she was walking home in a residential neighborhood on her way home from a grocery store at around 8.30 p.m. when she noticed someone walking behind her. She turned around and confronted him, asking him if he needed anything, and he said that he was just waiting for a friend. So even though she was really scared, she didn't really know what to do, so she just continued walking towards her house until she heard footsteps running up behind her. She was grabbed from behind by this man and was carried to a park in that neighborhood and was physically and sexually assaulted. Thankfully, a random stranger had actually pulled into the nearby parking lot facing the field with his truck. His headlights shined directly on this attacker and actually spooked him and made him run away. The driver of this truck immediately noticed the woman who had just been beaten and said that she was absolutely covered in blood and looked as if she had been beaten within inches of her life. He then went up to this woman to try and help her and she told him that her attacker had just ran off into the woods, so the driver actually followed him and tried chasing him. He tried looking everywhere for the attacker, calling after him and trying to find him, but the attacker was already gone. Of course, this good Samaritan called the police and this woman was taken into the hospital to treat her injuries. It also just so happened that she was able to scratch her attacker, so his DNA was under her fingernails. The next day, she gave police a description of this man. She described this attacker as being an African-American male, about six feet, two inches tall, weighing 200 pounds. He had short hair, a mustache, and a beard. They did their best to come up with a composite sketch, but they had no idea who this man was whatsoever. But still, once this DNA was matched with Morgan's killer, they had a better picture of who this man could be. Police were still confident in their theory that whoever dumped Morgan was somehow connected to Albemarle, which was the county that her body was found in, because of what we mentioned earlier about how this Anchorage farm was very secluded and closed off. Using the original sketch, the family urged caution, saying that this man could have changed his hairstyle, his facial hair, and that he's aged five years since the previous sketch, so they made a new updated one in hopes of jogging someone's memory. The family continued their efforts to search for Morgan's killer and to keep her story alive, but there wasn't much movement in this case until about four years after Morgan's body was discovered when police found connections to yet another young woman's case. Hannah Elizabeth Graham was born on February 25th, 1996 in Berkshire, England. She was actually in the United States attending the University of Virginia before she went missing. So on the night of September 13th, 2014, 18 year old Hannah was attending a party with some friends before she was seen at an apartment complex a few blocks away from the party at around midnight. Then at around 2.40 a.m., Hannah was seen on surveillance camera at a pub about three quarters of a mile away from that apartment complex. She appeared on camera to be very unsteady and was visibly intoxicated. She tried to get into this pub, but she was turned away at the door because of how intoxicated she appeared. She was then seen on surveillance video running down the street towards a gas station, but it did not appear as if anyone was chasing her. Then about five minutes later, witnesses spotted Hannah running once again towards a restaurant in the area. Then at around 1 a.m., surveillance video picked up Hannah walking in front of an Italian restaurant by the mall. This was in sort of their downtown area, so there were a lot of restaurants and stores all around. At around this time, Hannah had texted her friends saying that she was lost and was trying to find the party that they were all at. Then, as Hannah was walking, this same store camera picked up a man walk by Hannah on the opposite side of the Little Circle sidewalk area, then loop around after he saw her. This man was described as a large African-American male. This man was seen walking up behind her wearing light-colored clothes. He was walking about 20 to 30 yards behind her at this point. Then we see Hannah once again on surveillance video from a nearby jewelry store. At this point, she was seen walking with this unidentified African-American man walking side by side. They noticed that his arm was around her waist as the two walked together. After this, the two were not seen again on surveillance video. However, they were seen once again by witnesses at a restaurant slash bar called Tempo Restaurant. The two were seen together having drinks at the bar at around 1.30 
3 to 2 a.m. Witnesses said that Hannah was still very clearly intoxicated and that this man had his arm around her the entire time that they were there. Other witnesses said that as the two left, the man did not appear to be very friendly towards her. One witness said that they saw Hannah standing in front of this man's orange car saying, I'm not getting into the car with you. But then after this, Hannah was not seen again. Immediately, Hannah was reported missing and over a thousand volunteers set out on their search for Hannah all around Charlottesville. Of course, police went around to check surveillance video and they immediately noticed that Hannah had been hanging out with this unknown man and he immediately became their prime suspect. It took a few days, but he was ultimately identified by someone calling in with a tip. This man was identified as 33-year-old Jesse Matthew. Now, his name was leaked to the media, so Jesse actually brought himself to the police station and said that he wanted to get a lawyer. They tried questioning him, but he refused and would not give a statement until he had a lawyer. So, because they technically didn't have any evidence of any wrongdoing besides seeing Hannah with him the night that she went missing, they could not technically hold Jesse at the police station. However, they were able to put 24-hour surveillance watch on him. While doing so, they caught him driving his sister's car from his grandmother's house, and I think technically, since at this point he had not actually broken any laws, they could not chase him down yet, and they were not detaining him. So all they were allowed to do was just watch him. So he ended up speeding off from his house and police did follow him and then it got into a higher speed chase, but eventually they did lose him. At this point, the public was very well aware of who this man was and they were absolutely furious that police lost track of him when he was the prime suspect in a murder investigation. So police went out and did a press briefing and said that they just wanted to speak to Jesse. At this point, they were searching desperately for both Jesse Matthew and Hannah Graham. But at this point, they were able to put out charges for Jesse Matthews for reckless driving and for Hannah's abduction with intent to defile. Now, when the public found out about who Jesse was, Jesse's friends and neighbors were all very shocked that he was wanted for such heinous crimes. He used to play football and did wrestling and was very good at both. He was known as being a gentle giant who was friendly, outgoing, and went out of his way to help others. He worked as a patient care technician at the University of Virginia Medical Center, taking patients back and forth. He volunteered to help coach football at the Covenant High School and even helped coach a game just that Saturday before Hannah went missing. He was trustworthy and parents loved him as a coach. He had attended Liberty University starting in 2003 and started on the football team, but Turns out he was actually kicked off of the football team after he had allegedly tried to force himself on another young woman. Police did investigate this, but the woman decided not to come forward with charges, so he wasn't arrested or anything like that, but he was still kicked out of the university. So then he went on to attend Christopher Newport University and tried playing football there. However, once again, he was kicked out for more sexual assault allegations. But in this case as well, no charges were actually filed. Now, I don't exactly know why. I don't know if these women just didn't want to come forward or if police didn't want to move forward with the charges, if there wasn't enough evidence or something, but after leaving both of these universities, he started working as a taxi driver. So the taxi company in Charlottesville started questioning its drivers after Hannah went missing to see if anyone knew anything. Well, it turns out in 2009, Jesse was working as a taxi driver on the same exact night that Morgan was taken and killed. There were also at least 75 other taxi cabs in service on that night who were picking up people from the same Metallica concert at the John Paul Jones Arena. It also just so happens that Morgan was last seen getting into a cab before she was killed, so many people believed that maybe Jesse was also connected to Morgan's case. Of course, it makes sense that Morgan was going to get into a cab because she was looking for a ride to go home and generally you would think to trust a taxi driver. So after this, after fleeing police, Jesse was absolutely nowhere to be found and was just running on the loose. This was until he was actually spotted in Galveston, Texas, halfway across the country. 
So a woman was driving her car onto the beach when she spotted a man in a tent. Apparently he had kind of walked up to the car and just kind of looked at her and she immediately knew who he was by his wanted posters. She saw him and immediately knew what he was wanted for, so she immediately called the Galveston police, and she actually stayed at the beach so she could keep an eye on him, which honestly is pretty impressive and strong because I know that if I saw some very large man who was wanted for the murder of another young woman, or at least abduction of another young woman, I would not want to stay there to make sure I would want to call police and leave, but obviously she was brave enough and she did not want to let him go, so she sat there until police eventually showed up and arrested him right there and then. When they arrested him, they actually did find a map of Mexico in his car, so clearly he had plans to flee and go to Mexico. Don't really know exactly what his plan was, hoping that he just didn't get caught by border patrol or something, but nevertheless, they held him in Galveston for 48 hours before flying him back to Charlottesville. Even when he was in police custody, he absolutely would not cooperate with them and gave them absolutely zero information on anything. So, of course, they continued to search for Hannah until October 18th, 2014, when human remains were found. Human remains were found outside of an abandoned home about six miles outside of downtown Charleston in Albemarle County by searchers from the Chesterfield County Sheriff's Office. These remains were sent to the medical examiner's office and they were in fact confirmed to belong to Hannah Graham. They determined that Hannah had died as a result of homicide, but ruled it as an undetermined etiology. Turns out Hannah's body was found about only six miles away from Jesse Matthews' childhood home and only about five miles away from where Morgan's body was found. Using all of this, they were eventually able to get a search warrant to search Jesse's house. They were ultimately able to recover DNA evidence from a cigar butt and the t-shirt that was found that was Morgan's. The wooden cigar tip was taken from Jesse's wallet and that matched the DNA on Jesse's t-shirt as well as the DNA found under the fingertips of the rape victim from 2005. There was also forensic evidence found that linked Hannah to Jesse. I don't exactly know what it was. I don't think it was DNA, but we also have that surveillance video that shows her and Jesse together the night that she went missing. So originally, prosecutors only decided to charge Jesse on accounts of attempted capital murder, abduction with intent to defile, and sexual assault for the 2005 attack. Now, I'm sure that the reason that they didn't want to go straight to murder is because they simply did not have enough evidence to go straight forward with that charge. Technically, even though there was DNA evidence on Morgan's shirt, they can't prove that he's the one that actually killed her, just that she was with him at some point. Same thing with being seen with Hannah the night that she went missing. Doesn't necessarily mean that he's the one that killed her. But eventually, by May of 2015, police announced that they had received additional information that made them a lot more confident with charging Jesse with Hannah's murder, and they set out for the death penalty for capital murder. Again, I don't know exactly what all of this evidence is, but it made the case a lot stronger. Then, by September of that year, he was charged with first-degree murder for Morgan's murder. So, Jesse pled not guilty and went to trial for the Fairfax assault. The victim has chosen to stay anonymous, but we do know that this victim is actually originally from India, and she had moved back to India after the assault, so she had to travel a very, very long distance to testify. She wasn't even sure if she wanted to testify because she didn't want to have to relive this entire experience and face the man who assaulted assaulted her, but she did end up making the long journey from India to testify. Now, this victim had said that she was not able to positively identify Jesse Matthews as the man who attacked her. She said that she recognized his face, but that his hair looked different, so it made her unsure if that was really the person. So originally, the defense was going to use this to say that, well, she can't identify him, so we don't know if it's him or not, but because of the DNA evidence they had, 
it really was not important to her case at all that she could identify the man. The court actually eventually ruled that it was not fair to make her positively identify this man since it was such a traumatizing experience for her and we all know that memory is not the most reliable when you go through something that traumatic. At trial, she recounted her entire assault and at first she was poised and spoke in a very matter-of-fact way, but as she recounted what happened to her and the more detail she gave, of course, she got incredibly emotional and started to break down. Even nine years after the assault happened, it impacted her life in so many different ways. Next, the man in the truck testified at the trial. This man's name was Mark Castro. He said that he was actually driving over to a friend's house that evening to watch a boxing match, but then he heard faint cries coming from a patch of the woods. He said that after he heard this, he turned down the road and into the parking lot where he saw the victim covered in blood. Once again, he told the story about how, you know, she went up to him and the man ran off and that he tried looking for him, but ultimately could not locate him. He said that he stayed with her until paramedics arrived after calling 911 and described her condition as being absolutely brutal and very, very close to death. This was very important because it showed that it was not just Jesse's intent to sexually assault her, but that it was in fact an attempted murder. Reporters at the trial said that as this victim was testifying, she would not look at Jesse, but the entire time he was immensely staring at her, which is just creepy and I'm sure he just did it to intimidate her so that she wouldn't keep talking or that she would be too afraid to testify. So after the prosecution was done with their case, the defense actually requested a recess and this recess ended up being a couple of hours long. When they came back, the defense decided not to testify at all and instead they decided to sign an Alford plea. This basically says that he maintains his innocence but understands that there is more than enough evidence to get a guilty verdict beyond a reasonable doubt. People were very shocked that he ended up doing this but he was actually served with three life sentences because of it. It was basically just a way of him avoiding to having to admit that he raped this young woman and tried to murder her. So next we have the trials for Morgan Harrington and Hannah Graham. Both trials were set for mid to late 2016. However, in March of 2016, the prosecution came out and announced that Jesse Matthew would plead guilty to both murders. So because of this, he didn't have to go to trial for these murders. For this, Jesse was sentenced to four life sentences in prison. Now, when it comes to Hannah's murder, he was facing the death penalty if he went to trial, so this was his best bet to avoid the death penalty. In the end, he had seven total life sentences. So one good thing that came out of all of this was Help Save the Next Girl. This is a nonprofit or organization started by Morgan's parents, Dan and Gil Harrington. They work with campuses and law enforcement across the country to focus on safety and violence prevention. They work to spread safety awareness and prevent future crimes against young women. This can be accomplished through maintaining vigilance and personal awareness. As a community, we must know our neighbors, be responsible for one another, and cherish precious family. We believe that a positive legacy for Morgan includes our commitment to keep other young women safe. Morgan was smart, beautiful, and looking forward to becoming a teacher. She was excited to offer her enthusiasm to children and service organization, but destiny intervened. We hope our efforts will help to prevent dangerous and tragic scenarios for other families. In the unfortunate circumstance of a missing person scenario, we will work to ameliorate the anguish, grief, and confusion that are prevalent at such times. In Morgan Harrington's honor, we move forward and try to help save the next girl. I think it's absolutely amazing that Morgan's family has chosen to use such a horrific and unimaginable tragedy to help others and bring good into this world. I think it's absolutely amazing what they're trying to do and if you've watched any of my other videos, you know just how passionate I am about these types of crimes against young men and women. I am incredibly grateful that there's such an amazing community of true crime YouTubers on this platform to help spread awareness about this very important topic. I am very grateful that I have a platform here to be able to talk about these cases and spread awareness about these issues that so many people just 
don't know about. We all enjoy true crime as a whole and watching documentaries and watching other YouTubers and all of that, but we also know how to keep an eye out. We know what to look out for and how to keep ourselves and our friends safe. We know that it's imperative that we never, under any circumstance, let our friend go off on their own, especially when they're intoxicated. We know not to walk around looking straight down at our phone when we're out alone because we know that makes us more vulnerable and makes us more likely to be a target. We know that we need to keep aware of our surroundings and don't let ourselves get too distracted. We know that these types of things happen and we are not naive to the fact that crimes can happen against anyone anywhere. But you would be surprised how little the average person knows about these issues. Most of even my friends and family are not true crime buffs like us on this channel. It shocks me how little they know about certain issues because we just assume that they know, that everyone must know, that because we know it, they must know it. But that's not the case. You would be surprised at how often people just don't even think about personal safety or don't even think about going off on their own or, you know, letting their intoxicated friend go off on their own or anything. Some people just simply don't think about that and it's not because they are irresponsible or, you know, that they're dumb or that they should know better. Some people just simply don't realize that these things happen. So what I ask of you guys is that you please not only just stay informed, but to help your loved ones stay informed as well. Let them know what they can do to stay safe. Talk about all of the different ways that you can stay alert and cautious while not completely closing off your life to opportunities and doing fun things. All I ask is that we just continue looking out for one another to help prevent these disgusting crimes from happening. I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who took the time to listen to Morgan and Hannah's and this unidentified victim's stories. I am very grateful that these young women were able to get justice, but the fact that their lives were taken from them when they were just out doing fun things, just not with the care in the world, is just so devastating, and it shows us that do not let your friends go out alone. I know I keep saying that, but both of these women, all three of these women, were harmed when they were out alone, so I think it's imperative that we just are aware. Know where your friends are. Tell someone if you're going somewhere alone and just keep an eye out for one another. I know I keep saying that, but that's all I ask. Just keep an eye out for one another and try to help prevent these cases from happening. Both of these women were such bright young women with bright futures ahead of them, and they were going to go on to do so many great things for so many people, and their lives were just selfishly, brutally taken away for absolutely no reason. And there's absolutely nothing that can ever go back and change that, but we can take steps to prevent these types of cases from happening to you and your loved ones. But anyways, that is where I am going to end today's video. Once again, thank you for watching the video, and if you like this video, please make sure to leave it at the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Don't forget to go ahead and check out Native by clicking the link down below and using Rachel Shannon 2 to get 33% off of your order. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time.